Today is Tuesday, June 29, 2021, coming up on Roland Martin Unfiltered, debate on Capitol Hill about removing Confederate statues from the U.S. Capitol. That bill, that vote has been postponed. We'll tell you all about it. Also in Georgia, uh, a group has been created to study upwards of 3,000 buildings and statues named after Confederate heroes on college campuses. Could that soon be removed as well? Also, Republicans, they are attacking uh, the black hammer thrower Gwen, Gwen Berry regarding her stance on the American flag on the podium. I'm sorry, I thought y'all were against cancel culture. Hmm. NCAA is moving towards allowing athletes in all 50 states to profit from the name, likeness, and image. We'll talk with ESPN's Howard Bryant about that. Plus, a 76-year-old black woman uh, returned to jail because she didn't answer a phone call from her parole officer? What the hell is that about? Also, folks, uh, in New York, two black elected officials filed a lawsuit against the police department after being beaten with bicycles and pepper spray during protests last summer. Speaking of New, uh, New York, Eric Adams moves closer to becoming the next mayor of New York City. Plus, Washington, D.C. has elected its first incarcerated person to hold office. Plus, our Essence Festival throwback performances from Mary J. Blige, Master P, and Diddy and Bad Boy. It is time to bring the funk on Roland Martin Unfiltered. Let's go. Whatever the best piece on it, whatever it is, he's got the soup, the fat, the fine. And when it breaks, he's right on time and it's rolling. Best believe he's knowing. Putting it down from sports to news to politics. With entertainment just for kicks, he's rolling. just love, Republicans love to talk about cancel culture. They love to talk about how they were the party of Lincoln and it was the Southern Democrats who supported slavery and started the KKK. Yet why are Republicans the ones today in the 21st century, the ones who are standing uh, behind Confederate symbols? On Capitol Hill today, they had debate over the removing of Confederate symbols and statues from the U.S. Capitol. One of the things that have been talked about is that statue of uh, uh, the U.S. Chief Justice Roger B. Taney. Now, here's the deal. It was Taney who wrote the 1857 Dred Scott decision declaring that black people were not citizens. They want to replace his bust with that of Thurgood Marshall, the first black Supreme Court justice. Now, if signed into law, the bills would direct the Capitol architect to, quote, remove all statues of individuals who voluntarily served the Confederate States of America. The monuments would go back to the states that sent them. Hmm. Kind of makes sense to me. Frankly, I think it should be destroyed. So to my panel, Ben Dixon, host of Benjamin Dixon po- Benjamin Dixon Show podcast. Teresa London, principal founder of TML Communications. Dr. Mustafa Santiago Ali, former senior advisor for environmental justice at the EPA. Ben, I'll start with you. This to me is a no-brainer. But 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 it really does show you uh, how hilarious Republicans are when we talk about race and things on those lines. There are no greater defenders today of Confederate symbols than the Republican Party. 
Absolutely. Whenever they use that talking point about the Democrats being the party of the Confederacy, there's some accuracy there, but they act as though we don't know history and the uh, realignment. And the fact that right now today, there, like you said, Roland, there is no greater proponent of the Confederacy, the treasonous Confederacy against which Abraham Lincoln waged uh, the Civil War. And so if there's any group that is most aligned with the actual treasonous Confederacy, it is the people who are waving the flags today trying to defend the statue and trying to ensure that this country remains in an era when the Confederacy was not just a dream, but it was a reality. To, to, to that point there, uh, Teresa, um, we look at these Confederate uh, holidays, if you will, that, that are in these various states, um, the Republican states, South Carolina, Tennessee, Mississippi, Alabama, they love their Confederate day. Uh, and so, uh, that's why I don't want to hear a damn thing from any Republican, even black Republicans like Senator Tim Scott, when it comes to the Republican Party upholding these racist, domestic, white domestic terrorist traitors to the country. Yeah, but I think we're also going to see some of the Republicans still stay um, mute as they have been the entire time as we talk about some of these Confederate issues. And part of it is as much as, you know, Democrats and civil rights leaders and social justice and just more normal Americans try to educate them on what it is um, and why people are saying we need to remove the Confederacy and remove symbols of it. Um, we start to see the issues that arise from it. And so I'm hoping that you know and like everybody else that some of these um the, the votes that will happen is because the the education has happened on that level where they are taking a more credible approach and in, into protecting their citizens mustafa um, i mean these monuments they, they've got to go it makes no sense whatsoever you know that we were at war with the confederacy so let's use that as, as our template. So we don't have monuments to Germany or Japan or Italy or Russia or a number of the other countries that we've been at war with. So it makes no sense for us to highlight individuals who are attacking our country. I used to walk through the Capitol when I used to work there on Capitol Hill and, and I would always marvel at the fact that we had some folks who had completely made sense to be there because they gave contributions, serious contributions to our country. But then on the other hand, we had these other folks who tried to dismantle uh, and break down our country uh, and take over the country. So it makes no sense whatsoever for those uh, figureheads to continue to be highlighted they should be in a museum or in a closet somewhere where those folks who have an interest in going to take a look have that opportunity to, and hopefully folks will also give the full narrative of what the Confederacy actually was and the damage that it did to our country in the past. And even till today, the ripples still continue and we see them play out with many actions across our country. Well, uh, look, the, the bottom line here is uh, these, these bills are important. Some people will call them symbolism, symbolism, but when you keep these up, what you're doing is you're emboldening the hate. Uh, there has to be a systematic assault on all hateful symbols in this country. That's what's needed, pure and simple. That's what's needed. They have a desperate attempt, uh, desire to redefine what is evil, what is bigoted, what is the actual definition of racism. And this is why there's so, uh, this, uh, they're in a, such an uproar to get rid of critical race theory because they, they, they got a little headway with trying to define racism as anyone who talked about racist issues or racism issues. Remember that era? Well, now they're, they're really trying to make sure that we are never able to understand what is actually right and wrong in this country, because that's the only way they can maintain their powers by gaslighting America and saying there's nothing wrong with these Confederate images. There's something wrong with those of us who are opposing it and trying to, quote unquote, cancel the Confederacy. But I'm pretty sure uh, President Lincoln did a good job of that already. Yeah, but, but I think the thing here, Teresa, that is, is really important for us uh, to understand is that we have to really look at this consistent attack on anything dealing with race. And the, the thing that's amazing, the number of people who really support white supremacy perspectives, but then say, I, I, I'm not racist, I, I'm not a white supremacist, 
which goes to show you they have no idea even how the depths of white supremacy and how deeply it is embedded in American culture. Absolutely. And again, we can keep trying to hit the nail on the hammer when we talk about educating about our past and present and sort of um the i think the objective here of some of our congressional leaders is you know the reasoning why this legislation is coming up for a vote is because of the lack of education that has been given in you know our public school systems and so I think when we start talking about the the confederacy and how it's harm and, and and it's harm from the past and now i think in modern day terminology we're now talking about race and all of this really stems from white supremacy it stems from uh racial bias it stems from you know issues that we're now talking about we need reforms from police reform from brutality and so all of these items really kind of stem from one thing and we shouldn't have any monuments or statues, um, especially that that sits um, highly by our communities, um, having that same effect to remind us that racism still exists and no one uh, cares about ridding it at all. Mm. And and the thing here, Mustafa, is that um, somebody might say, "Well, why does it matter?" Well, I tell you what: if if I've got a kid and that kid is coming to the nation's capital, and you're going to statuary hall and you're looking at uh, the uh, statues that from your state. Last thing I last thing I want to be a black man uh, or a black mother, and then I'm having to say, "Ooh, look at the statues from our state." The racists who did not want us to even uh, exist to be able to read, to be able to live. Yeah, we understand the game and, and why many of these statues and monuments were were brought. You know, they weren't brought in 1870 or 1880. You know, it was the 20s, 30s, 40s, and 50s when in many locations they actually came in. Of course, there was policy that was connected to that, politics that was connected to that, and it still plays out today. So we have to make sure if we truly want our country to heal, if we truly want our country to be able to move forward, then we've got to make sure that we're removing the hate. And of course, these have been symbols of hate for decades upon decades. They no longer have a place in the 21st century. Uh, and and, and uh, in fact, I, I want to show y'all something. I, I just pulled this up. Uh, hopefully, uh, we can. This will actually come up. Um, this was from the folks at Axios, uh, where they showed. Uh, this is called Confederate Monuments in the U.S. Over Time. Watch this. Mm. Oh wow. Folks, that right there, that right there, again, looking at this graph, it shows you, uh, and you see the bottom, how many were removed in the 1920s, one, you get to the 80s, one, get to the 2000s, one, then 61 and 98. So the reality is most of these monuments, most, most of these monuments were removed in the last, uh, in the last uh, two years. That's where they were removed, pure and simple. Roland, I'm looking at that graph that you just put up, and it, it's it's terrifying to realize that this country has left the seeds of treason um, sown so deeply into the the fabric across this country. There's 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 just too many people who are tolerant of the treasonous Confederacy that we're still talking about it all this time later, and we're still dealing with people who believe in it so much that they will overthrow this government in order to protect their white male Christian supremacy here in this country. But I, I I'm serious. If if America doesn't get serious about rooting out white supremacy, that map is going to look more and more red as the years go along, and we're going to look up and wonder how. How did the Confederacy win in the long run? And that's because America, uh, uh, well-meaning, uh, progressive white liberals, they don't want to do what's necessary. And, and this is why the Confederacy is still here today as opposed to Germany, Nazi Germany, where you can't put up statues of, of, of Hitler. You can't put up uh, uh, Nazi symbols. But we see the Confederate flag has already made its way back to the White House or rather uh, to Capitol Hill on January 6th. Uh, absolutely there. And, and and all of these things go together. You look at this whole now, this whole controversy with regards to Olympian uh, Gwen Berry. Uh, she, of course, uh, made, the Amer made the Olympic American Olympic team. She's a uh, hammer thrower, made the Olympic team. Um, and she took issue. She turned her back on the American flag as a national anthem was being played in the U.S. Olympic trials. 
Uh, she was draped in a black T-shirt over her head that said activist athlete. Now, Republicans, oh, my God, they've been losing their mind. Texas Congressman Dan Crenshaw says she should be kicked off uh, the Olympic team. Really? I, I, but I, I, I thought y'all were against cancel culture. Uh, the issue came up at the White House press briefing. This is what Press Secretary Jen Psaki had to say. We don't need any more activist athletes. I, I, you know, she should be removed from the team. The entire point of the Olympic team is to represent the United States of America. Right. It's the entire point. Okay, so, you know, it's, it's, it's one thing when these NBA players do it. Okay, fine, we'll just stop watching. But now the Olympic team, and it's, it's multiple cases of this, they, they, they should be removed. That, that should be the bare minimum requirement is that you, is that you believe in the country representing. Uh, this weekend, Gwen Barry, who hopes to represent the United States as an Olympian on the hammer throwing uh, events, won a bronze medal at the trials, and then she turned her back on the flag while the anthem played. Does President Biden think that is appropriate behavior for someone who hopes to represent Team USA? Well, uh, Peter, I, I haven't spoken to the president specifically about this, but I know he's incredibly proud to be an American uh, and has great respect for the anthem and all that it represents, especially for our, our men and women serving in uniform all around the world. He would also say, of course, that part of that pride in our country means recognizing there are moments where we are, as a country, haven't lived up to our highest ideals. And it means respecting the right of people granted to them in the Constitution to peacefully protest. Mm. Well, now, uh, Teresa, uh, again, boy, these conservatives are really upset with Gwen. She's got them in a tizzy. Uh, Gwen is exercising her constitutional right as an American. And I think there is no stage other than the present one that she has worked hard for, that she has prayed for, and that she has made it to, where I believe she was the only one in the league that uh, was an African American woman in that um, in that space. So if she decided, you know, to take a knee or to put a T-shirt up to say this is what America is right now, you know, as we say our American flag, um, it is what it is. And I think you know we all should continue not you know to support her. Um, and I think uh, the the conservatives are really just upset because they. Um, as much as they want to treasure the national anthem, I, I think um, that they, they also want to uh, disguise it, um, that America is doing everything, you know, right when, I, again, we, we have to really call it what it is. There's racism in America, there's a divide in America, and then peace needs to happen, but I think that happens when everybody gets on board. Well, Ben, they, they are really upset, but, but again, these are the same people, the same people who love the Second Amendment, but they always skip that first. Unless it's, you know, them using it, right? Exercising their right to free speech and to protest. And um, they even push their right to protest all the way to treason and marching up the steps of the Capitol on January 6th. So I want to make sure that we we, we really, and, and everyone really considers what this proposition is that they're offering us. They're saying as white angry conservative men in this country you have the right to protest all the way to the point of revolution you have the right to revolution but as a black person you don't have the right to take a knee you don't have the right to put a a, a turn your back on a national anthem who has some verses in there that are not conducive for the black experience uh, and, and here's what's interesting to, to me it was interesting to me mustafa uh, if you could pick up uh, on on this here uh I, i'm going to show you <laughs> this i, I want to show you uh, to me, the contrast, the contrast that exists. Uh, we talk about uh, what's going on uh, here. This here, um, this here is uh, an image. This is Gwen Berry on the left, but you see the, the folks on January 6th on the right. And who stands with the people on the right? Um, guess what? Republican Party. And, and also, I also thought, Mustafa, they said, support the veterans. Gwen's a veteran. Mm. Hmm. I mean, Gwen's a shero. Let's just let's just call it out. She's a shero in a long line of sheroes and heroes who have been uh, sports figures who have been willing to stand up and do the right thing. This is not the first time that Gwen has called out the injustices that continue to happen inside of our country. So you know, when you have these folks, as Ben said so aptly, you know, who will forgive dismiss, 
uh, pretend as invisible the things that happened on January the 6th, but will quickly, will mm -hmm. very quickly hone in on any athlete or entertainer or others who are willing to call out where the gaps are in our society and saying, fix them. They're not saying that they hate our country. They're saying that they want our country to live up to its ideals, to live up to the words that you place on a piece of paper and then you tout to the rest of, of, of civilization across our planet about how great we are. Mm. So she's calling out that fact that there are still injustices that are happening and, and that we have to do something about it because she has a platform along with others uh, you know, other athletes and entertainers who have a platform as well, who are saying that it is our people who are dealing with the injustices that are happening from police brutality. It is our communities that are dealing with healthcare issues and housing issues and all the, and, and the wage disparities that exist. So she is doing what she feels in her heart of hearts is the right thing to do. And there are so many people who support her because she's not using violence. She didn't grab the flag and beat a police officer with it. She just said that at this moment in history, I need you to do better. And this is my way of putting a spotlight on needing you to do better. But see, but, but the thing I want to bring in Howard Bryan uh, with ESPN, Howard, uh, you know, you, you covered uh, the Colin Kaepernick story. And, and, and Howard, I, I thought they kept telling us um, that this is disrespecting veterans when you do this. She's a vet. <laughs> I mean, I'm, I'm just saying, I mean, I would think uh, the person who wore the uniform to protect the flag and protect what it means might have a good understanding of what she's doing. Yeah, I, I think that after a while, when you look at these types of stories and you see them there, it, that's why I always just call it Gaslight Nation, right? I mean, there's no there's there's no sense to it. It doesn't make any sense. We know exactly what it's all about here. And we know that the bottom line here is, is that there is a, there, there's a capital here that, you know, that this opposition uses in order to benefit themselves. It doesn't make sense. It's not supposed to make sense. I, you know, I think that one of the things that gets me about this role, and you and I have talked about this, is that I'm concerned about where athletes are. And I'm happy that Gwen Berry is doing what she's doing to a certain extent, even though some of it feels, um, it, it just feels, I don't know, I don't want to say hopeless, but it feels like I'm not quite sure I get where the end game is with this because it's become so obvious that there's no dialogue involved on the other side. But I worry about the athletes because last year when Jacob Blake got shot in Kenosha, what happened? The athletes went to Barack Obama and he told them to be citizens. And, and they went back to work and they went in and they did all the right things and they set up the voter drives and they doubled down in Georgia and they did all the things that citizens are supposed to do and they won. And then what happened? Then you get January 6th, which is a direct slap in the face, not just to the ideals of the democracy and all those highfalutin ideals or questions. It's, it's also a direct slap in the face to the athletes. It's, it's a direct response to them, to what they did. And so I'm really interested in seeing how they continue to play this out when it's obvious now, and it was just as obvious it was before, that there's no dialogue to be had here. It's a fight. Uh, it, it absolutely is a fight. Uh, it is one uh, that, I mean, you made that point about, you know, them going to Obama. And this is why, frankly, uh, I think on issues like this, you don't go to people like Obama. <laughs> okay, I, I, I'm serious because the bottom line. Is, I know I'm not. I'm not I, laughing because it's funny. I'm laughing because it's mean, true. I mean, but the bottom line is, uh, you know, Obama also told a lot of the activists in Ferguson, you know, to be patient, and they're like, "No, hell no, we've been patient long enough." Yeah. Um, and look, he he is a part of the establishment, and the reality is, he is no longer a he is no longer a community organizer. Okay, he's not. He's a politician, and. Uh, they don't like heat. They don't like pressure. And I think really what has to happen here, uh, you've got to have athletes uh, who uh, who are aligning with people who this is what they do. I dare say if you are an athlete and if you're trying to decide who you want to meet with for guidance, don't go talk to President Barack Obama. Go, to, go talk to Reverend Dr. William J. Barber. Before we yeah, campaign. I mean, that, that's, that's who you go talk to. Yeah, well, and that's one of the reasons why one of the other concerns that you have with 
with this movement, if you want to call it a movement, is is it's let's instead of broadening our definitions of activism, let's narrow it. Let's narrow that definition of activism because I I make a, a clear distinction between empire and and activism. I I think what you're seeing a lot of with the players now is conflating the two that okay, if you buy a team, that's activism. If you have more connection to the society at large, if you if, if you align yourself with Bob Kraft, that's activism. Or if you buy a piece of the Boston Red Sox, as LeBron did, that that somehow puts you in the Muhammad Ali category. No, it moves you further away from that category. The question that you know you and I have been talking about this for years has been what happens when the protester becomes the power? And in some of the cases, the athletes are becoming the power. What are they going to do with that power? Because the separation between the player and the street is getting bigger and bigger. What are they going to do about it? Uh, absolutely. Now, we actually had you talk about this uh, other story, uh, the NCAA after the Supreme Court decision when it comes to uh, uh, athletes. Now they're moving. Hey, we got to pass the rules that, you know, allowing these athletes take advantage of their likeness. Um, Bob, look, let's just be clear here. They're trying to protect their million dollar salaries. They see what is coming down the line. Uh, this Pandora's box is about to be wide open, Howard. Well, and not just wide open, but once it becomes wide open, how do we keep it closed in our favor? Wide open means there's open competition. Wide open suggests that it can go any direction. And that's not the case here. This is the athletes having power. And it's also about the athletes making sure that the NCAA doesn't take what they already have. So um, in terms of, um, you know, what do you see happening here? Because uh, I think you're going to see an even wider gulf between the Power Five conferences. Now you even hear the, have the conversation uh, about uh, expanding the playoffs. I, mean, I just think bottom line here, uh, at the end of the day, people just got to say, look, everything comes down to money. It's about TV contracts. It's about billions of dollars. And this is where uh, athletes got to do their part. So here's the question. Uh, are you going to see – um, are you going to see consortiums created of folks um, going out and marketing these deals? Are you going to see Rich Paul and uh, or, or some of these other agents uh, creating uh, a college division to be able to handle these things? Because it's going to be a little difficult for an athlete to do it themselves when they don't understand that landscape. Well, that's that's the wide open part of it. When you're talking about does this thing, when you talk like that, you have no idea what it's going to end up. You have no idea what it could be. That That absolutely is your Wild West scenario. I think it's going to go in a different direction. I think what you're going to see is you're going to see the NCAA try to impose very, very small, very granular changes, demand or ask for patience, try to rely on itself and stall and, and prevent at all costs a Wild West scenario where they, what they really want is to make it appear that they are still the governing body, that they are still in control and whatever reforms and whatever changes take place, it's happening with their support and not in spite of who they are. So to me, the real battle is taking place that's going to take place is how much compromise is going to take place to create this new landscape, or is it going to be some sort of form of revolution where you have to essentially, if you're the Dukes and the NCAA and the North Carolinas and the rest of them, you have to adjust on the fly like everybody else, or are they going to try to keep as much of this old structure in place, bring in a few changes here and there, and then try to create these five, 10-year plans, and so by 20 years, you've moved two feet. And 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 look, um, you know, we, we know a lot of these guys have been making a lot of money under the table for a number of years. Yeah. Uh, these universities have been benefiting from them signing footballs and helmets and jerseys and things along those lines. Uh, but now what we're talking about now uh, is, hey, if, you, if you're a big time uh, player, hey, you, you can not, not go cut you a, a car sponsorship deal. Yeah. Uh, you can go cut you a restaurant deal. I mean, so it, it really it, it really is. Uh, it's going to be a great opportunity, but the key is who is going to be able to manage these opportunities. Uh, and so, uh, it, it, and then of course, now you've got the university who yeah. they've made a lot of money getting the athletes to sign stuff for free. I wonder now, Hey, if you're a Heisman trophy, uh, you know, candidate, you say, I'm not signing for 50 hell. Well, exactly. Well, and remember something else involved with this too, Roland, and that is, 
that you've already had star players not playing in bowl games so they don't get hurt going to the next level. So you've already seen a little bit of that drop off of power from the NCAA because the athlete is protecting themselves as the asset. So I tend to think you're right. I think that the real another question that's really worth figuring out or you know, worth discussing is how many people are we actually talking about? Like, what is the actual percentage of people where you're going to really bring in a change? Most of these athletes, especially once you get out of the power five or when you start talking about college basketball and some of the, the other parts of the college game, it's not a pot of gold for them. It may be more for them and it may help them a bit, but I do wonder what the raw number is. And to your point, it does seem to lead almost to that, that super league idea that they were talking about in soccer in, in, in Europe a couple of months ago that fell apart within 48 hours. The possibilities are very, very high if it becomes that Wild West and you say, OK, let's make a look, take a look at this landscape and let's find out how many people are actually talking about in terms of who are the real superstars who can really benefit from this, because most of those players, if they're that good, they're in the NBA already. If we're talking about basketball, they're going to be there one year. If it's football, maybe two years. So it's going to be a fast grab. I, I don't see it necessarily as, as as the top line players. How I'm sort of viewing this and in, in, in what I think is really going to be happening here um, is that this is really going to be um, the, the opportunity for uh, a player who might be an all-conference player yeah. Um, really somebody who, and, and again, you, you, you're not, look, I'm a Texas A&M graduate. I mean, it's a ton of people who would love to have uh, the starting running back show up or ribbon, ribbon cutting ceremony or show up or something along those lines. And so it's I me, mean, you can pick up, you know, Hey, fine. My parents fee is 500 bucks, a thousand dollars. And so, I mean, hell you could be an athlete and have, 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 have a weekly appearance uh, at a local restaurant They'll be happy or have the local, or, or have your paid local radio show like the pros do or like the coaches do. There you go. You know, there I mean, you if, if you are a Heisman Trophy player and everybody knows you're going pro in four months, that's still four months that could very well be a hundred thousand dollars for you right there having a sat a, a Sunday radio show post game or a Friday show before the game. There's all kinds of different ways you can monetize this. The real question is, is how much of the monetizing of it is going to directly affect the idea of competitive balance, right? That's the other piece. It's like, okay, if the players are making money, I don't have a problem with that. I've never had a problem with that. The issue is going to be, okay, now we're making money and does the game look the same? Does the game look different? Does the game look better? Does the game look worse? What is the game going to look like as these changes are taking place? Um, you're absolutely right. And I think uh, that example... Uh, with regards to uh, the College of Bowl Games uh, is a great one uh, because, you know, a lot of people, Howard, were really upset. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, I can't believe these guys are, are not playing and, and you know, we, you know, we have an opportunity to win the bowl games. And they're like, who the hell is we? We, who exactly. Well, we? let's not forget. Hey, don't forget, Roland. Don't forget this. Also, we go back. You're we talking about Kaepernick earlier. Let's go back to 2016, 2015 where you had Missouri and you had Northwestern trying to unionize and using their. So if you take all of these different pieces and make one big puzzle, you can see the shift. It's it's it may look like these things are disparate, but everything is moving into the same direction, which is which is a greater empowerment of the labor. That's what's taken place. If you take that step back, take Missouri, take Northwestern, take players deciding that they're not going to play in bowl games when they've got a million dollar payday or $10 million payday waiting for them if they just sit out of this game. Take that, take name and licensing as, as well with the Ed O'Bannon rules and everything else. Add all these things together. And if you're the NCAA, you, you know, you look more like Mike Krzyzewski saying, OK, my time is over. It's time for something else. Uh, yeah, so it's going to be uh, I think it's going to be real interesting uh, to watch. I'm all in favor of disrupting this whole system uh, for the benefit of the players. They, they've been uh, they, they've been providing a free labor for a long time. Uh, I just want to make sure that they don't still get screwed in the process. And so, well, and that's uh, the game, please. because yep. Mark and those guys, they're not going to give control away for free. <laughs> because they're, I'm sure they're sitting in their in their boardrooms going, there's got to be an opportunity here if we play this right for us to make even more. Yep. Yep. Great point. Howard Bryant, ESPN, man. Certainly appreciate it. Thanks a lot. No, my pleasure. Thank you, Rob.
Mustafa Santiago Ali, want to get your thoughts on this in terms of, again, uh, what, what we're about to see here uh, with these players uh, being able to uh, benefit financially uh, from their likeness. I mean, I, again, I, I, I love it. I think it's great. Uh, and it's long overdue. I'm fully in support of it. I was a college athlete and I saw a lot of really good athletes who got used up. You know, and some of them got hurt and, and then, you know, those injuries have followed them throughout their life. I just want to make sure that there's some real infrastructure uh, for the players um, who are going to be able to take advantage of this, because that's critically important. Because, as you all have just said, there'll be a lot of folks who are going to jump into this space and they're going to try and figure out how they're going to get their piece of the pie. Um, and, you know, lots of times athletes come from rural areas. Sometimes they come from urban areas and they may not have a strong uh, sort of understanding of some of the financial sets of opportunities and pitfalls that are out there. So I just want to make sure that there's real infrastructure behind them so that they don't get taken advantage of, as they have in many other instances. But this is a step in the right direction. Um, and it's time for folks to actually be remunerated for all that hard work, all those hours that you spend working out in the gym, on the field or on the court or on the track, um, so we'll see how it plays out. And I'm glad that y'all also, you know, it's beyond just the superstar athletes who are in college. When you play at, you know, a smaller college or university, there are all kinds of other financial opportunities that will exist that they'll be able to take advantage of and are huge for folks who are coming from very limited economic backgrounds. So I'm fully in support of this. I just want to make sure there's real infrastructure to make sure that folks are taken care of. Uh, ben, American capitalism loves free labor, and um, it's good to see this era uh, start to come to an end. I am concerned about equity and making sure that some of the players, particularly black players who don't have uh, that support base, that infrastructure, they don't have attorneys, they may have uh, they may not be a superstar, so they may not have access to agents. We want to make sure that they get uh, don't get taken advantage of in a system that is thoroughly designed to fleece every bit of dollars that they can out of uh, labor. Uh, Teresa there. Yeah. Yes, right, Teresa. Can. Uh, yes. Teresa, uh, your thoughts about this? I concur with my uh, colleagues here, um, but I also think there is an opportunity where um, it's not only monitored in the um, decision uh, for these athletes in order to use their name and likeliness, but I, I do believe there is some, some opportunity of growth here on the current decision that I'm looking forward to seeing in the near future. All right, folks, going to go to a break. We come back. 76-year-old black woman misses a phone call from a parole officer. So they send her back to prison saying, well, she could have been out robbing a bank. So we're going to treat her like a bank robber. She's 76. It's as stupid as hell. Plus, our Essence Festival throwback. Uh, some great concert performances uh, that I shot with my great front row seats. We'll show you all that. You're watching Roland Martin Unfiltered back in a moment. When you study the music, yeah. you get black history by default. And so no, no other craft could carry as many words as rap music. I try to intertwine that and make that create the, whatever I'm supposed to send out to the universe. A rapper, it, you know, for the longest period of time had gone through phases. I love the word. I hate, I hate what it's become, you know, and in, in to this generation, the way they visualize it. It's narrative kind of like has gotten away and spun away from, I guess, the ascension of black people. I'm proud of the officers I worked with on January 6th. They fought extremely hard. Our worst nightmare really come true, uh, an attack on American democracy uh, right here in the nation's capital. I experienced the most brutal, uh, savage, hand-to-hand -hand combat of my entire life. I received chemical burns to my face that still have not healed to this day. I just remember people still swinging metal poles at us and they were pushing and shoving. They were spraying us with, uh, you know, bear mace and pepper spray. They were all shouting at us, calling us traitors. It's been very difficult seeing elected officials and other individuals whitewash the events of that day or, or downplay what happened. As an American and as an Army veteran, it's sad to see us attacked by our fellow citizens.
Midas Touch is responsible for the content of this advertising. Black women have always been essential. Mm -hmm. So now mm -hmm. how are you going to pay us like that? And it's not just the, the salary. Mm -hmm. I mean, there are a whole number of issues that have to support us as women. Yeah. But that's what we deserve. Mm -hmm. that we shouldn't have to beg anybody for that. And I think that we are trying to do our best as a generation to honor the fact that we didn't come here alone and we didn't come here by accident. I always say every generation has to define for itself yeah. what it means to move the needle forward. Mm -hmm.
see. Yeah, that was, that, yeah, those were uh, great. Absolutely. So, <laughs> pull the graphic back up, please. Uh, this weekend, uh, go to uh, the 2021 Essence Festival of Culture Live Loud Virtual Experience. Uh, you can watch it this weekend. Uh, EssenceStudios.com, Essence.com, Friday, Saturday, Sunday. And so, check it out. And so, we certainly appreciate uh, partnering with Coca Cola. Uh, to drive tune in uh, to the uh, virtual Essence Festival. Uh, we got a couple more throwbacks for you uh, during this show, Diddy and Master P. So y'all can't wait uh, to see those. Uh, all right, folks, uh, th this one story here, man, I, I saw you talk about was just strange. It, they just made no sense. And it goes to show you how nonsensical this nation is uh, when it comes to dealing with folks who are uh, incarcerated. So, black woman, grandmother, is back in jail because she didn't answer her phone when the parole officer called. Her name is Gwen Levi. Her attorney says she didn't answer the phone because she was in a computer class. Now she's being treated like an escapee. They literally said, well, she could have been out robbing a bank, so therefore we're going to treat her like a bank robber. Doing this right now is Kevin Ring. He's the president of FAM, Families Against Mandatory Benefits. Uh, Kevin, glad to have you on the show. So, I, so he's, I'm confused here, Kevin. Does the judge not have any discretion? Does I mean, was the judge left with no choice to send her to jail? Yeah. What, explain explain yeah. What, what, what's going on here. No, it's absurd, but it, uh, you, you got it. I'm glad you're bringing attention to this. And it's not a judge's decision, unfortunately. This is the Bureau of Prisons, and jailers are going to jail. And they have one rule, which is when you're on home confinement, you got to follow all the strict rules. She's on an ankle monitor. This woman went to a computer class to improve herself. She went to a uh, building that used to be a police station. So if she was trying to escape, she picked the wrong building. But she was uh, trying to be an advocate. She's been home for a year. She went to a computer class. They couldn't get in touch with her because the way the building was configured, her ankle monitor wasn't registering. So they called her on her phone. She had it off. And so because it, when she left the class, she turned it on, saw she had these messages. She called. They said, you were out of touch. The class was three hours. They said, you were out of touch for that much time. We're treating you as an escapee. And we appealed it. Uh, we heard about this case because we've been working with Gwen um, on her advocacy, and we reached out to the Department of Justice and to the Bureau of Prisons and asked them to reverse this decision, and they wouldn't. And so for the last you know, week and a half, she's sitting in the D.C. jail waiting to be transferred back to federal prison for that reason alone. So, so who in the Department of Justice? Um, what, what agency is over this? Or who, I mean, you know, who makes the final call uh, to overturn this nonsense. Well, I mean, the what happens is you're at a halfway house. That's who's overseeing your home confinement. So that's who you're dealing with. You have a case manager at the halfway house. They make this determination. And then you can appeal this to the Bureau of Prisons. And like I said, the Bureau of Prisons is located inside the Justice Department. And so this is run by the administration. So we went to the senior leadership of the Bureau of Prisons and they said, no, we stand by the decision of the case manager of the halfway house. Um, they've sent other people back for, you know, similarly, you know, small infractions. And um, but this is this is a decision by the Bureau of Prisons, which runs the federal prison system. And uh, it doesn't make a lot of sense. Um, I, it's just. What I don't understand is it's costing the federal, it's costing the taxpayer more money to have her sit in jail than to be at home. Not even close. And and here's the thing, she's been home for a year. Um, she served 16 years. She's been home for a year, infraction free. She's you know she's, and, and she served 16 years for what? She served 16 years. She was um, charged with heroin trafficking. She and a person transported heroin from New York City to Maryland. She stored it at her house for packaging. She was convicted of a conspiracy. The prosecutors played hardball to get her to cooperate against others, including family members. She was not willing to do that. And so she did not get a good deal. And so though she pled guilty, she got 33 years in federal prison for that offense. And 
there was some changes to the sentencing guidelines. So that was adjusted to 24 years. So she had 24 year sentence after they made some changes. She served 16 years of those. And when the pandemic hit, Congress passed this CARES Act that said, you know, anybody who served more than half of their sentence, nonviolent, low level, clean record, you can go to home confinement for the rest of your sentence to clear people out of the prison system. And Gwen was one of them. So she got to go home a year ago, was on an ankle monitor, all of her, you know, supervised. That's a very, you know, it's not totally free. Um, she can't make a movement without getting permission beforehand. So, but she complied and she'd been, you know, doing everything right for that year until this happened. And the thing that's so insane about it, as you said, is the cost. Somebody in the Bureau of Prisons, even if this was a technical violation, forget that there's a miscommunication. She had her phone off. She should have had it on. I mean, she's a 76 year old grandmother who's learning technology in a computer class. So she turned her phone off. Somebody had to sit there and think, this is worth sending her back to federal prison for years for. We're going to spend over $100,000 incarcerating this cancer surviving grandmother who was home caring for her 94 year old mother just because she did this. And so it just shows something you said at the outset, like there's just no common sense. It doesn't make any sense at all. Um, it, 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 ma it makes no sense. So, so, so what now um, do you, the Bureau of Prisons uh, obviously say we stand by it. Mm -hmm. uh, are y'all trying to reach um, Bonita Gupta, uh, Merrick Garland, uh, are you trying to get the attention uh, of uh, the White House? Uh, are there members of Congress uh, who are, 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 are standing with y'all and trying to uh, raise awareness on this? Yeah, well, let me just say, the reason we were working with Gwen is because she's part of a bigger class of people. So as I mentioned, during the pandemic, they gave the attorney general authority to get some people out of prison on home confinement with more time than they would usually get. Gwen is one of 4,000 people that were on home confinement for extended periods of time. They were told when they left, you don't have to come back. You comply with the rules and you can stay. So there's 4,000 people on home confinement right now. Four days before President Trump left office, his Justice Department issued a legal memo that said, hey, when the pandemic ends, you all have to come back. And so as soon as President Biden took over, we've been meeting with all of the people you mentioned, White House Counsel's Office, everyone is aware of this, to say, hey, you got to get rid of that memo or use your clemency authority, keep these people home. You know, they, they don't need to come back to prison. Not only is it a waste of tax dollars, you're going to separate these families again. A lot of these people came home. Some got jobs. Most of them got jobs. Some started college. Some bought houses. Some told their kids, I'm, I'm home for good. If they thought they were going to have to go back to prison, they wouldn't have told their kids that. So they thought, I'm home. Gwen's the same thing. I'm home to take care of you, mom. So they were promised, you're home for good. Then at the last minute, the Trump administration says, no, you got to go back. And so we've been pressing the Biden administration to reverse that decision. And the only way they're going to get relief now is if he commutes these sentences. So Gwen is one of 4,000 now who needs clemency from this administration. These are the lowest level offenders we have in the federal system. Think about it. Bill Barr, who wrote the book on mass incarceration, cleared these people to go home. He applied this criteria that said you couldn't have violence in your record, had to serve 50% of your record, no disciplinary infractions. These people were cleared, considered safe by Bill Barr to go home. And it would be madness for Joe Biden to bring them back. Unbelievable. Uh, well, Kevin, certainly keep us updated on uh, what how this uh, story progresses. Yeah, absolutely. And thank you for bringing attention to it. I appreciate it. Thanks a lot, Ben. Uh, th this is a perfect example of the sheer lunacy of the criminal justice system in this country. I mean, this right here. What, it, to, I, I don't understand how anyone with half a brain could say, "Yeah, sure. Let, let's send a seventy-six-year-old grandmother back to prison." Uh, yeah, she's such a threat. That's what a carceral state does. That's what a police state absolutely is going to do because she is a cog in their machine. And you're right. It absolutely does cost taxpayers more money to imprison people than it would for any other activity that we could do with them. But that money doesn't just go into the abyss. It goes into the hands of the prison industrial complex. So there are people, and, and I'm not saying this for your benefit. I know you know this, but just wanted to put that into this particular conversation that there are industries, there are there are businesses that profit off of the number of bodies that they can have. And so they make no, they, they won't discriminate against someone because they're too old as long as they can get those tax dollars to fill that bed in the prison cell. 
it, it just, it's, 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 I, I don't, in any way I can't understand it, Teresa. Um, and, and this is, this is where you, you think you have people who with common sense, people with um, a basic understanding of humanity, but also just the sheer cost. It, I don't think she's probably flight risk. Right. Just, just what, just saying. No, you're absolutely right. I, I, again, it, if we allow the systems to uh, really dictate, um, you know, where we are and who we are um, as a as a um, as Americans, I, I mean, so like when when I saw the, I, I think they hit on the. Um, uh, on the form, it was an escape uh, that she, you know, that that's where they filed her as escape when they couldn't get in contact with her. Um, instead of understanding, you know, one, she's a 76 year old woman and understanding some of the other factors that could have been into play, you know, the, the internet was down, you know, maybe the phone rang twice, who knows. But I think there could have been some more, um, instead of literally just putting in, in the system, uh, that key word that pretty much is a hot topic word for um, the agency in order for them to have some of those drastic changes. I think there needs to be some reform even within the system, because even, you know, at a time where it, you know, if this one was 76, if, if she was 85, regardless of her age, I think there you know, again, should have been some best practices that could have been done that that could have prevented, um, you know, this heartache and stress. Well, Mustafa, I mean, I mean, you know, what we're dealing with here uh, is is a society that's all about throw them in jail, uh, lock them up, talk, throw away the key. And I'm sorry that if the woman was in a computer class, you would say, hmm, sounds like rehabilitation to me. Right. But we know that when it comes to folks who have been incarcerated, there's always been this dehumanization. Uh, of we're that. having an issue with Mustafa's audio. I cannot hear. I can hear. I can hear. Can you hear me? Uh, I think we're. Um, I think it's a problem. Uh, you sound real muffled. I was real just saying we've always dehumanized uh, folks who have been uh, imprisoned. So we got to understand the dynamic that continues to happen. We also just got to call out the fact that we got 2.2 million folks who are in prisons, whether state or federal, or who are incarcerated in detention centers because. We have a country that that is the default, especially for people of color. And then of course you overlay that with the dehumanization. So it's easy to do these actions. And we should also call out the fact that the probationary officers had to have given permission for her to actually be in the class. So therefore they should have known that from mm. time X to time Y, that's where she was going to be. If you're taking a test, you can't pick up your phone because your professor or your teacher is not going to allow that. So there are all these different dynamics that are going on. And let's just also call out the fact of the cost. It's about $36,000 a year that we spend to incarcerate someone. So it just makes sense for her to actually be able to be home, helping to improve her life, taking care of her mother. That was Cher, her 94-year-old mother. So there, it just makes no sense besides the fact that we've got a system as Teresa said, and as Ben has also shared, that we've got to reform the system because the system is not set up for an individual to be able to better themselves. They need mm -hmm. folks to continually be revolving through this prison industrial system that we have. And we've just got to change that dynamic. And that means that both the Department of Justice and the president have to get involved in these types of situations, making sure that folks don't have to go back into the situation that they found themselves in before and actually provide some real hope for individuals so that they want to make sure that they are able to better themselves. Can't hear you, Roland. Sorry about that. We come back. We're going to talk to a couple of officials out of New York, talk about the story out of New York with a couple of public officials filing suit against the New York Police Department for being beaten during protests last year. Also, D.C. elects his first formerly incarcerated person to office. We'll explain who he is. You're watching Roland Martin Unfiltered. Back in a moment. When you study the music, yeah. you get black history by default. And so no, no other craft could carry as many words as rap music. I try to intertwine that and make that create 
the, whatever I'm supposed to send out to the universe. A rapper, it, you know, for the longest period of time has gone through phases. I love the word, I hate, I hate what it's become, you know, and, and to this generation, the way they visualize it. It's narrative kind of like has gotten away and spun away from, I guess, the ascension of black people. I'm proud of the officers I worked with on January 6th. They fought extremely hard. Our worst nightmare really come true, uh, an attack on American democracy uh, right here in the nation's capital. I experienced the most brutal, uh, savage, hand-to-hand -hand combat of my entire life. I received chemical burns to my face that still have not healed to this day. I just remember people still swinging metal poles at us and they were pushing and shoving, they were spraying us with, uh, you know, bear mace and pepper spray. They were all shouting at us, calling us traitors. It's been very difficult seeing elected officials and other individuals whitewash the events of that day or, or downplay what happened. As an American and as an Army veteran, it's sad to see us attacked by our fellow citizens. <sighs> Midas Touch is responsible for the content of this advertising. Black women have always been essential. Mm -hmm. So now mm -hmm. how are you going to pay us like that? And it's not just the, the salary. Mm -hmm. I mean, there are a whole number of issues that have to support us as women. Yeah. But that's what we deserve. Mm -hmm. That we shouldn't have to beg anybody for that. And I think that we are trying to do our best as a generation to honor the fact that we didn't come here alone and we didn't come here by accident. I always say every generation has to define for itself yeah. what it means to move the needle forward. Mm -hmm. So this is Roger Bob. I got a message for Roland Mascot. Oh, I'm sorry, Ascot Martin. Buddy, you're supposed to be hooking me up with some of these mascots. I'm sorry, ascots that you claim to wear. Where's mine, buddy? Hey, yo, Peace World, what's going on? It's the Love King of R&B, Raheem Devon, and you're watching Roland Martin, Unfiltered.
All right, folks, the second weekend, the second weekend of the 2021 Essence Festival of Culture Live Loud Virtual Experience. You can watch it at EssenceStudio.com and Essence.com on Friday, Saturday, and Sunday, July 2nd through the 4th. Uh, and so please check that out. We really appreciate Coca-Cola partnering with us. And we're not going to have a show on J uh, July 5th. That's the day after uh, 4th of July. We'll be off, but on July 6th, we'll have our regular show plus our recap of the second weekend of the Essence Virtual Fest. All right, folks, let's talk about this uh, story out of New York. Uh, in New York, two black elected officials are filing a federal lawsuit against the New York Police Department after being beaten with bicycles and pepper spray during protests last summer. State Senator Zelnor Myrie and Assemblywoman Diana Richardson alleged protesters were treated considerably differently at Black Lives Matter protests for George Floyd than rioters at the Capitol on January 6th. The suit states police and city officials should be liable for 11 separate violations of the constitutional rights. Myri and Richardson are seeking compensatory and punitive damages for the abuse. Uh, it, it is quite interesting, uh, Teresa, how protesters across the country have been treated. But, oh, man, the kid gloves of those thugs on January 6th. Big contrast. Yeah, but that also tells you the heart of the person who's supposed to be serving you. So, I mean, you know, when we see hospital workers acting as um, almost, you, you know, the, the judge and the lawmaker for, for actions, when really they need to be looking at the person. But I think it also shows, again, the individual um, of the one, you know, in, in the vicinity. So when we see, you know, activists utilizing their first amendment right and i'm talking about black lives matter and then we start to see the insurrection of the of those people so doubt that it even happened um it it, it really is concerning so you know i it's just concerning all all around but the thing here benjamin uh, again we see how police if black folks are protesting we got riot gear we got tanks we got all the stuff out White folks who love Trump protest, um, it's all good. Let's remember that these people are ideological, right? We, a lot of times people make the mistake of thinking that because they put on a badge that the person behind it is all of a sudden absolved of their political ideology. But a lot of these people who are behind the badges carry as much a strong political ideology as anyone that you saw on January 6th. In fact, some of them out there on January 6th had badges formally. Um, or, uh, you know, we've seen military people be infiltrated by white supremacy. We've seen uh, former police officers show up on January 6th. All of that said, the people who are responding to Black Lives Matter protesters are very clear about whose side they're on. They are on, they are on the side of white supremacy and they're on the side of protecting this system from black protesters and people who are protesting on behalf of black lives. It, it really is clear how these things are so different, Mustafa. Uh, and I guess now in future protests, uh, when they happen, black people should yell, hey, can we get the white folk January 6th treatment? <laughs> yeah, that'd be all right if you could get that, but I wouldn't count on it. <laughs> you know, we saw BLM protests across the country and the brutality, you know, the excessive force that was utilized. Let's contrast that with what happened in the Michigan State House <laughs> when those men ran up in there with guns and no, none of them were beaten. None of them had to deal with excessive force and they literally had weapons with them. So we see the, the disparities that continue to exist. And of course, we know that it's rooted, unfortunately, in, in systemic racism and belief systems that far too many folks in the law enforcement family have. And that's why, once again, we have to be so much more critical of the individuals that we allow to put on a badge so that we can make sure that there's a real relationship there um, and that folks actually can have and build trust again in that entity. And I know that that's going to take a lot of work, um, but it, but it's necessary. 
Well, yeah, I mean, uh, but but look, I just need us to understand that uh, you're going to have these huge, huge differences uh, repeatedly, and and we got to keep calling them out. We got to keep putting folks on blast and letting them know that uh, we're not blind. We see exactly what is going on, and so uh, a lot of people want us to somehow uh, act, as, act as if we don't see it, but mm, no, we actually do. Folks in D.C., Joel Casting is now the Ward 7 Advisory Neighborhood Commission. It's on the commission uh, with the help of the advocacy group Neighbors for Justice. Casting and four other incarcerated inmates ran for the seat. His victory was made possible by a provision passed last year restoring voting rights to the people convicted for felonies in D.C. His district, his district includes the D.C. jail, a nearby women's shelter, and luxury apartments. Um, we should see more. We should be seeing more of this, Benjamin, uh, in this country. Because we can't keep saying, hey, um, you're back. Hey, um, you know, you are, uh, you should, you should uh, get back and involved in society if there still is a scarlet letter on, on the chest of anyone who served time in prison. You know, this actually reflects and mirrors exactly what we just got done discussing. It is more profitable for these businesses that are recipients of tax dollars and through the prison industrial complex, they get that money and they're more than happy to facilitate it that way. But we see that reverberating effect throughout the entire system rolling. And I and I, I think we really just have to come to terms with what this country really is, especially as it pertains to the criminal injustice system and realize where we stand as black people um, in, as th the system was built on our backs. This system was built on our exploitation and this prison was built on our slavery and now it's built on our imprisonment. Teresa. Yeah, I agree. Um, so, I mean, when one is in, uh, incarcerated, I think, you know, uh, many suffer, um, especially if there's no reform. So I totally agree. The, the, the thing, um, Mustafa, that we are seeing, and there has to be even more of this, um, and this is where I think uh, political leaders are important. If we build in incentives for businesses to hire veterans, Ain't that hard to say, do the same for those formerly incarcerated. That's right, they're returning citizens, just like brothers and sisters who fought, you know, in, in foreign wars or, or whatever, coming back home. These are folks who also are coming back home. Let's make sure we make sure that they understand that they are full citizens. I appreciate uh, Brother Joel so much because, you know, Ward 7 and Ward 8 are east of the river. Um, and, and in those communities, yes, there is, gentrification and change that's happening, but they're also some of the most challenged areas in the city. So having a representative uh, who, who comes from and who folks can connect with, who maybe have also dealt with some of the similar challenges that he did is so critically important. And let's also talk about evolution. So one, yes, across the country, folks should be moving in this direction to make sure that folks who have done their time um, have the opportunity to actually fully engage in the civic process and be able to run for office so they can continue to give back. But we also got to make sure that federal jobs and financial aid for colleges, where there are still these instances where you can't get those if you've been convicted of a felony charge, you know, it limits your ability to be able to um, fully be able to give back, to be able to fully grow, to be able to support your family, to be able to support your community. So we have to have the evolution um, you know, across the board. And I really appreciate that he's standing up, taking the responsibility of holding an elected office and will force folks to actually make sure that real change is happening. I, I do want to uh, talk about uh, the, um, uh, the political race uh, in New York. This is the first time they actually had ranked voting. Uh, and uh, what, as a result, uh, it's taken a while to actually uh, count up the ballots. Uh, and this right here, uh, you, I'm about to show you, is the headline on Politico, uh, on Politico, uh, that's showing exactly uh, what's, go what's going on here. Um, that is, Eric Adams uh, stays ahead, but Garcia surges to second and first tally of ranked choice votes. Um, and so now, if you, if you scroll down, you'll see the story. Adams is up by uh, nearly 16,000 votes. Uh, Garcia uh, went past Maya Wiley uh, for second place. Uh, as a result, uh, it's uh, down uh, to uh, those two. Uh, and so uh, what do you make of this race? Uh, what do you make of um, all of the talk, Benjamin, about 
progressives in New York City uh, that Eric Adams uh, is still the one who is leading to be the next mayor of New York City. And so many people uh, were thought that my Wiley uh, was going to be the choice. Yeah, uh, a lot of eyes were on on Maya Wiley. Um, I am really interested in uh, the ranked choice voting portion of uh, of 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 this race, uh, but our eyes are still on it and seeing in terms of like who's actually going to get the results. Uh, this this New York race has been uh, up and down, uh, it, and and had a lot of wild turns in it because not only because of how many people were in the race, but because of the personalities that were they were in the race and the and the varying degrees of of experience as well as qualifications. Um, and, and so I, I I'm really curious as to how this is going to finalize in the end, but also to see if rank choice voting can start spreading across the country, because I think it is also a mild type of reform that is actually a benefit uh, to democracy as a whole. Do you think that that I mean, I, I, I know some other people, uh, Teresa, who say, look, um, you got one vote. It should be one person. Uh, do you believe in ranked choice voting? Um, I'm new to it, um, so I'm not sure if I really believe in it, um, but I am interested in the process and I am watching it um, as you are in with the New York race. So um, I believe if it works and it gives people uh, additional options to um, look at this uh, sort of uh, voting, um, I need to look at it a little bit further before I say let's run with it. But I, I, I'm definitely looking at the New York race. Mustafa. Well, you know, New York's an interesting place, especially when you look at the Democratic side of the equation. You know, it's usually been more of a centrist type of candidate to win, even in the, you know, with the with the current mayor. If you really unpack many of his policies, mm -hmm. he's a centrist. So to see who's currently leading is not a surprise to me. Garcia, although, you know, um, she has done um, some progressive work also has some centrist leanings as well. So I get it, you know, people think about New York City being this progressive bastion. Um, it, it's actually, you know, a fairly centrist type of a city. Um, so where we currently are, it, it's not a surprise to me. As it comes to, uh, you know, I've always been one who believes in one person, one vote, but as Teresa said, if there is a better system that is more representative of the people, then I think that we should definitely take a strong look at it and see if it actually plays out in the way that folks hope that it does. Uh, speaking of uh, playing out um, the uh, Georgia U.S. Senate race next year, is going to be quite interesting. Uh, Donald Trump keeps uh, pushing Herschel Walker to be uh, his choice to run against Pastor Raphael Warnock. Uh, any of you uh, licking your chops at Herschel Walker running for the United States Senate against uh, Pastor Raphael Warnock? I'd like to see it. I'd love to see um, because I think I, 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 I not think I know 100 percent sure that uh, white conservatives think all they got to do is put a black person in, in, in the race and they could divide the black vote. Um, but we've been paying attention really closely here in Georgia, and uh, we would love to see him uh, try to run against War Warnock. And of course, uh, you've got a lot of crazy outlandish things that Herschel Walker has said in the past, uh, Mustafa. Uh, and a lot of crazy stuff that his son says every single day. Uh, and so uh, that's going to be um, a, a whole lot. If you're black, you're living in rural Georgia. Uh, yeah, Herschel Walker, Herschel Walker is considered a collegiate god there. Uh, but it's a lot different when you're talking about let's represent us in the United States Senate. I mean, we already have one football idiot uh, there, which is Tommy Tuberville representing Alabama. <laughs> yeah, let's not even talk about Tuberville, but... <laughs> You know, uh, Herschel was an amazing football player. But once the spotlight is really hit on him on the political and on the policy side, and people really see some of the things that he's behind, I mean, if you just put him behind a screen, right? Didn't see color, listen to some of the things that he uh, espouses, that he supports, that he believes in, you would not think that he was a man of color. And you definitely would um, probably align him with many of the folks that we've seen do some very outlandish things uh, over the last year. And, and I see why Trump and others are such a big supporter of his ideologies, um, because the things that he talks about are not uh, the types of things that you would expect someone to support in the 21st century who came from the background that he did. Everybody has the right to feel however they want to, um, and, and to live their life the way that they do. But the things, I, I encourage folks to go out and Google um, Herschel Walker 
um, and, and some of the things that he's sharing and, and make an informed decision. Uh, I think Ben and others who are right there in the thick of it uh, will keep you highlighted to the craziness that sometimes is being espoused and the dangerousness of it. Oh, there's a whole lot of crazy there uh, that we can absolutely um, uh, 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 look at. Uh, and uh, but, but I need other people to understand uh, even with all this craziness, uh, those idiots who support uh, who, those idiots who support um, uh, Donald, Donald Trump, they'll go with stupid. They'll, they'll be happy to go with stupid. Absolutely. And that's why I think, Roland, it's so important to get Herschel Walker on um, your platforms and, and many more to, to expose the type of craziness that will come from uh, a Herschel Walker and, of course, his family, because we know his decisions is not his alone um, to the U.S. Senate. And those are some of the decisions, even his ideology before he even runs for public office um, is is probably the most damaging that that could be when we talk about um, our own democracy and what that could look like on the legislative level. So um, I think people will be well aware um, of Herschel Walker, of who he is. If they don't know now, I'm sure as they keep running his name through the fire, um, he's going to get burned pretty soon. Uh, yeah, so I can't um, absolutely. I cannot wait uh, for uh, that election. Uh, I plan to spend uh, some time in Georgia because uh, the last thing we need to do is have that fool Herschel Walker uh, and his idiotic comments uh, there in, uh, in in the United States Senate. Uh, folks, got to go to a break. We'll be back. Roland Martin Unfiltered, back in a moment. You have been on a treadmill set on 12.0 yeah. this whole week. Yes, sir. It's, uh, but, you know, it's been lovely. It's been we're, we're here fighting for a cause and a purpose, and we're delivering against that. And so it's worth it. So you can you can yank it up to 13, but only for a little bit. <laughs> I mean, I was seeing you. You're like, OK, OK, yeah. I got gotcha. you. OK, hold on. OK, gotcha. So, so, I mean, this, but this is a new experience for you. Uh, very new experience. You know, it's. It's not too long ago I was selling soap in the parking lot across from the convention center, you know, uh, to now to now having to 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 go through all of this and be a part of all of this. It's just, I mean, you can't you can't ask for more than this type of dream to come through, and then to be able to share that with everybody, right? And to be able to take that dream and invest it back so that other people can can live out theirs as well. So so it's been good, but. When did that hit you? You that story you just said. You come in here like a bunch of the folks you see here. Yep. They just trying to get their hustle on. They do, they got t shirts and oils in the hats, yep. and they just trying to make it happen. Yep. And then go, whoa, yep. whoa. <laughs> yeah, you know, um, it hits you at not at one moment, right? It's it's like all of the things that you have aspired to do and when you start to do them and you realize and like oh you know and then you know even just like standing here right prior to this year i'd never even been in a room where there was a, <laughs> a red carpet <laughs> you know so i'm like okay this is different right um but it, it's it's those types of experiences and then that triggers in hey you know now the responsibility is to is to share this experience right? and to make sure that we're enabling way, way, way more people to move from that parking lot to come into this room and to be able to talk to you. Last question. I saw the email. I woke up this morning. I see the email. Uh, and again, as a content creator, I see this deal you guys announced with Queen Latifah. Yeah. Yeah. You know, it's um, uh, it's very it's, it's, it's very timely and it's also critically important. You know, we, we talk about owning our culture. Right. And we talk about um, creating wealth for our community, right? And the, 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 most, the most valuable thing that we have left as a community, and the one thing that they can appropriate at times, they can misappropriate at times, but they can never take, is our culture. 
I, I, I gave an interview where I said, they would say, Roland, how can, when I ran Chicago Defender, yeah. Roland, but, you know, the Sun Times, the Tribune, uh, and I said, let me be clear, they can never out black me. No, they, 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 they cannot. And they can what, cover our stuff, but they can't out black me. They can't out black you. And, and what we have to do is monetize our culture. Right. And so that's what that fund is about. That fund is about monetizing our culture, creating equity for our content creators, for our makers, so that they can have enough of a, uh, a base that they can reinvest in themselves and back into other young entrepreneurs that are that are content creators and that are makers. And so so that's what that's about. So we're, we're partnering with uh, with Queen Latifah and Shakem, but we're going to have other partners and, and, and we're going to talk. All right, folks, uh, again, uh, be sure to tune in Friday, Saturday, and Sunday for the 2021 Essence Festival of Culture Live Loud Virtual Experience. Uh, that, of course, uh, is taking place. You can watch EssenceStudios.com, uh, Essence.com, EssenceStudios.com, as well as uh, Essence.com. All right, uh, the, 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 the final story uh, for us today, I, I, I figure we'll have a little fun um with this story here so uh little tucker carlson little tucker carlson Teresa, he, he says that the nsa is spying on him that the president joe biden national security agency yeah they're spying on him i i, I really think um tuckum should be drug tested Teresa. These these are some of the most demented people I've ever seen. And what's so interesting is Tucker Carlson is making a lot of money uh, doing this. You know, he went from not only the daytime uh, talk show, but now I'm sorry, not only nighttime, but now he has a daytime talk show, um, Tucker Carlson Today. Mm -hmm. And these are the type of, you know, I think rhetorics that, you know, conspiracy theories and QAnon and other um, type of conspiracy theories that are happening within the conservative party that is it, it's still highlighting the notion that, you know, again, Trump is still president. The insurrection really never happened. You know, <laughs> like there's so many of these um, uh, ever ending conspiracy theories that I believe the audience, again, that he's catering to says, you know, that they believe, you know, aliens are still watching, you know, uh, Biden's tapping in, probably calling them on three way. And so some of these, um, again, this just goes into to the base. So anytime Trump has a rally, we understand, you know, uh, some of these conservative uh, conspiracy theories happen. Um, and, you know, it it, it it just heightens it. So, I mean, there's nothing to say outside of, you know, Car Car Chuck Tucker Carlson's getting paid very well to do exactly what um, he's paid to do, and that is to heighten conspiracy. Uh, I, 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 I get a laugh, I, I really do. I, I, get, I get a laugh out of these people. 
um, as, 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 mu as much as I can, um, Mustafa, because th they really are uh, stuck on stupid. And, and, and I know people always say, well, you know what, you shouldn't say these things about, uh, you know, about um, other voters. But if you are a regular Fox News viewer, you're an idiot. I mean, you, you you really are an idiot because they will knowingly lie to you and just make stuff up. In, in fact, uh, I got to show this here. The folks at Media Matters uh, put together this particular um, video of how all of a sudden Fox News, they're they so against a January 6th report excuse me, a commission, a select committee commission. And the, the folks at The Daily Show love putting these videos together, how you can compare um, what Fox News will say when Democrats are in control compared to when Republicans are in control. If y'all want a good laugh, please, by all means, Watch this. Despite Boehner's reassurance on the integrity of the investigation, the left is already branding this as a witch hunt carried out by a scandal-obsessed and delusional Republican Party. The House greenlit another witch hunt, this one into the January 6th riot. I, I'm totally for it. I, I'm always interested in learning more about any mystery, and Benghazi has mysteries at the center of it. It's a farce. It's a complete farce. It's partisan as hell. It's fake. Don't play along with the fraud. The Gazi story keeps getting bigger. But this is simply not over. It's like there was a conspiracy and a cover-up. Why would this administration cover up for the death of Americans? Why would the administration cover up for Al-Qaeda? This is a cover-up, and it's the worst kind of cover-up. A cover-up of a cover-up. The Democrats are claiming that you are covering up for insurrectionists by opposing <laughs> this commission. Your response? Not at all. There's already four investigations. You mentioned one, and now we want to put a political commission to go forward. Everybody thought Hillary Clinton was unbeatable, right? But we put together a Benghazi special committee, a select committee. What are her numbers today? Her numbers are dropping. Why? Because she's untrustable. But no one would have known any of that had happened. And we I not agree. Thought, That's and something that good. I give you so credit for that. You mentioned Benghazi. If you are so serious about getting to the bottom of that, why not appoint a select committee? Why not a special investigative committee? Witnesses under oath. Let's see if they do go with the select committee. Might finally get some answers. These are answers we need, not for political reasons. These are answers we need in order to prevent something like this from happening again in the future. Let's have trial by combat. It's obvious they cannot be trusted in any way, shape, manner, or form to conduct any fair, fair hearing whatsoever. They're incapable of it. They're consumed with hatred of Donald Trump 24-7. It has come to this. A Benghazi Select Committee headed by Congressman Trey Gowdy is now being formed to get to the bottom of the terrorist attack that left four Americans dead. And tonight, we're going to break down the anatomy of a lie and how we got to this point. All we ask for is truth and justice. I, we just want to understand what really happened. It's what I believe the constitutional responsibility that Congress is, is to do. If I was in Congress, and I'm not, I, I would not have voted for this. The body that's supposed to perform oversight of the executive branch is now busy rehashing the events of January 6th. They're going to do anything, Raymond, to keep that narrative alive of January 6th. Benghazi. 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 9-11 style commission to investigate the insurrection of January 6th. Remember that? It's when a bunch of middle-aged people deep in credit card debt. White supremacists teamed up with a guy dressed like Chewbacca to overthrow our democracy. The Democrat-controlled Congress went full steam ahead on the January 6th commission. Of course, we really know what that's all about, targeting and punishing Trump supporters. So thankfully, Republicans blocked the commission legislation. One of the alleged rioters who stormed the Capitol, apparently criminally, now has a new defense for his actions. He says Fox News basically made him do it. His lawyer pushing this for real in court with a phrase, Fox-itis. Imagine believing things you hear from a channel that purports to provide news and facts. <laughs> hmm. <laughs> All right.
right, folks. Uh, that's got to be just uh, a, a comedy uh, Teresa to watch. It's, it, it's, it is funny, but it's also disgusting at the All same time. All right, folks. Uh, because we are using taxpayer dollars to host some of these investigations of which, um, you know, again, the investigation just seems to work if it's in the favor of the Republican conservatives. Um, but again, when it's uh, to tell, you know, really put the report together for the American people so they can make an um, effective decision. Um, again, we just got to read through the blur. You know, we got to read through the lines on this thing. It's, it's interesting enough, but that was a good clip. What you're dealing here, Mustafa, uh, you're dealing with a bunch of liars, a bunch of pathetic, shameful, decrepit hacks uh, who consistently lie to their audience and their audience is dumb. They're lying to them about critical race theory. They lie to them about Sharia law. That's what they do. And it's all about how we stoke the anger, the cultural wars of, of white people in this country. That's what Fox News is all about, pure and simple. Not facts, not common sense, nothing else. That's what it's all about. Well, it's dangerous, and we should call that out. You know, sometimes folks will laugh at the buffoonery and other types of things that go on there, but it is truly dangerous. And it is also strategic. That's the reason that the repetition happens where they tell these same types of false stories over and over and over again, and they pump it into the folks who watch their station so that they begin to believe it also. And you have to understand the history behind this. These are the children of Pat Buchanan and Rush Limbaugh and a number of others who understood that they needed a vehicle to be able to indoctrinate uh, Republicans and, and they tried to get others as well uh, over the years. And that's why Fox was created. And it has become a monster, literally. I don't even think in the early days when they were trying to put this vehicle together that they thought that it would become what it has. And it, it's created, it is literally, and, and, and folks can debate me on this, it has radicalized many individuals along with other entities that are a part of this very similar set of information that they continue to pump forward. And that's why it becomes dangerous. That's why you see things like January the 6th. That's why you see the actions that happen at the Michigan State House. And that's why you see a number of other actions across the country because people start to believe the hype and they get, they get so energized that they think that they have to do something and then they wrap it in this, in this label of patriotism that they think that if they do certain things, they can get away with it because folks who make millions and millions of dollars are saying, this is what you need to do. These types of behaviors are okay. And that's what Fox News has become. Um, ben. Fox News is the uh, front line. They are the, the tip of the spear for white supremacy. And I don't believe that they knew when they started all those years ago that they would actually be able to get away with this much lying. Yes, they did. Um, but no, they, no, no, no. they do know no, now. No. Actually, no, they did. I mean, this is, if you read Gabriel Sherman's book uh, on Roger Ailes, Roger Ailes is the mastermind of Fox News. He is the Republican operative. Fox News is absolutely a division of the Republican Party. And they knew that if you could lie in political ads, you could lie with the network. Yeah. Well, they've they they're excelling and they're I mean, we're getting to the point where they're going to literally be able to tell their audience two plus two is equal to five. Uh, we're well past the Orwellian 1984 uh, interpretation of what a, a propaganda machine like Fox News uh, could be. We're at the point where it, it is so entrenched at Fox News that the audience is demanding it. I think we're so far gone in terms of the propaganda that if Fox News ever tried, they would never. But if they ever tried to tell the truth, then their audience will devour them because their their audience is demanding the lies just as much as Fox News is providing. Well, and, and what has happened is, is that um, because you have competitors like OAN and Newsmax who will happily lie even more so uh, then Fox News is scared of losing viewers. Uh, you mm -hmm. saw what happened when Donald Trump was pushing OAN and Newsmax. Uh, then you got other you got other people out there as well. You got the folks, uh, of course, of the digital operations that conservative billionaires are funding, uh, whether it's Breitbart, whether it's the Daily Wire, whether it's Dan Bongino. Uh, we can go on whether those the, the Federalist Society, uh, all of these Republican billionaires are funding this entire ecosystem of lies and deceit. And these idiots who read them and listen to them, they believe everything about it. That's why they're running around 
saying, oh, no, look what happened. I mean, like this audit in Arizona, which is so stupid, is so bad. They turn over the voting machines. Now Arizona says because of what these people did to them, we can't even reuse them. We're just going to buy more. Oh, where are the people who talk about taxpayer waste? I mean, these are demented people. And what we have to understand, and I'm very clear here, if you support Donald Trump, you are the enemy. I don't care if you say, well, I'm if you're James Baker and you're like, well, I'm a Republican. I'm always Republican. No, if you will support liars, hateful, racist like Marjorie Taylor Greene and these other people, uh, that Bobert idiot, uh, that bobblehead out of Arizona uh, or Colorado, wherever the hell she's from. If that's who you're willing to support, you have no business being in public office and you must be taken out. Got no choice. So the rest of y'all sitting at home who don't want to vote, uh, guess what? If you sit your ass at home, this is what you're going to have running the country. And then what are you going to complain about? Ben, Teresa, Mustafa, I certainly appreciate it, folks. Thank you so very much for joining us on today's show. Uh, folks, if y'all want to support what we do here at Roller Martin Unfiltered, please do so by joining our Bring the Funk fan club. Every dollar you give goes to support what we do. You can support us via cash app, dollar sign RM Unfiltered, paypal.me forward slash R Martin Unfiltered. Venmo.com forward slash RM Unfiltered. And of course, Zell is rolling at RolandSmartin.com, rolling at RolandMartinUnfiltered.com. Folks, that is it. Thanks a bunch. I look forward to seeing you guys tomorrow. Our last day in our original office, we go to our new joint. Can't wait for you guys to see it. Gotta go. Holla! <laughs>